Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Thanks, everybody, for uh, being here. He like said, my name is uh, Lieutenant Commander Patrick Didier. I, as you can see, am an officer in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Officer Corps. Uh, I'm an aviator. I've spent the last 11 years of my career flying uh, research aircraft, doing the snow surveys that I'm going to talk about today. I do the hurricane research missions. I've flown mammal surveys. I worked with the Naval Research Lab. So I have a, a fairly long career, over 4,000 flight hours, uh, supporting these different operations. Something else I've been doing over the past uh, some like nine years is working on my master's degree in geographic information systems from the Penn State World Campus. My advisor, Dr. Justine Blanford, made the trip down from State College yesterday. Thanks for being here. Um, so I've been working on that for the past nine years uh, and trying to tie it into what we do here at the National Water Center and what we do in NOAA. Um, so things I'm good at, flying airplanes, not taking myself too seriously. Things I'm not good at is coming up with quick, catchy titles for uh, capstone <laughs> projects. So today's uh, presentation is called Sample Density Analysis and Optimization Strategies for NOAA's Airborne Snow Water Equivalent Surveys. Uh, so this is under the Department of Commerce, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and the National Weather Service. And if anybody's interested in getting one of these uh, cool patches, just uh, come by and see me at the National Water Center. They're for sale. <laughs> All right, so today I'm going to give you a probably not so brief introduction to the snow survey program because I think you have to have a, a solid understanding of how we do this work to understand exactly what my project entails. The goals of my project uh, were really more like a business case analysis. Like I wanted to look at how we collect these data and look at methods for getting getting more efficient with the collection of the data uh, using spatial analysis tools to get there. So I'm going to talk about the data and the methods that I use for this project. Uh, at the end, I'll go over some of the results, uh, try to tie that into some recommendations moving forward. And uh, I think we have a lot of time today, so hopefully you guys have some good questions. All right, so first of all, uh, if you guys work in water resources, you've probably seen this graphic before. Uh, it's from 2005. It shows why snow matters. Um, as you can see, in northern North America and northern Eurasia, snowfall accounts for over 50% of annual freshwater runoff, and in some places nearly 100%. So it's very important to know how much water is in the snowpack. It affects our water supply. Um, the way I think of it, my background is not really in meteorology or, up until this point, geography or, or engineering. My background's in biology and flying planes. Uh, so I tend to think of water supply, when I first showed up to this project, I think of water supply in terms of reservoirs, lakes, streams, you know, where, where all the water is. Um, after flying these missions, I realized we have another water supply, and that's the snow on the ground in the winter. The advantage to that snow on the ground is it's just this big, I mean, I wouldn't say static because it does change, but it's out there for three, four, or five months. You can go out and measure it, and you know exactly how much water is in the snowpack before you have to make all the important decisions about dams and floods and sandbags and all that. So it's, it's an important uh, data set to know how much water there is in the snowpack. Uh, winter tourism, I just throw this slide up there for, for those of you from Alabama. This is what uh, snow looks like. Uh, this is Steamboat Springs up in uh, Colorado. We actually have flight lines that go right over the ski areas. So I, said, I enjoy my job. Uh, and then this is our bread and butter. This is the National Weather Service. This is one of our core missions is to protect life and property. Uh, when the snow melts, sometimes bad things happen. Uh, typically up in Grand Forks and Fargo, that's kind of our bread and butter. That's where we do a lot of our work. This uh, picture was taken in 2006 by yours truly. Uh, you can see just the devastation. This is just a couple days. It was like a rain event on top of snow. That snow just went right into the, uh, the Red River. It couldn't take it. The floods all get, or the fields all get flooded out. And you can see uh, flooding and ice jams up along the bridges. So. We do this to protect lives and protect property. NOAA's Airborne Snow Survey. This is actually a new picture. So this is uh, this was taken in 2016 up in uh, North Dakota. This is one of the aircraft that I fly. It's the Jet Prop Commander. A lot of fun. A uh, little bit of background about the Snow Survey program. It's, uh, it uses Cold War era technology. It actually started in the, um, the late 70s by Dr. Tom Carroll. Uh, it was originally limited to the upper Midwest. Uh, like I said, that bread and butter, that Grand Forks, Fargo, the area that's really prone, prone to snow melt. Um, that's where we really started the program. Uh, the data were so valuable that they decided to expand the program. They wanted to look at what was going on with uh, freshwater 
resources in the intermontane west. So we wanted to research uh, lines in Colorado and Utah. So we acquired a turbine-powered aircraft, that's that jet prop commander, that can do that kind of work in the mountains. Uh, today we include over 2,600 uh, flight lines throughout the U.S., uh, 35 states and Canadian provinces, basically anywhere it snows, we have background data that we can go out and fly. Uh, the data support various NOAA offices, primarily river forecast centers, uh, weather forecast offices, uh, regional operational centers. Uh, those are the NOAA offices we support. We also have uh, federal partnerships with NASA. We back up some of their operations, some of their observations. Uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers we've been working with since the mid-80s. Uh, and then we also have regional and water, uh, regional and local water managers that we supply data to. So gamma detection theory, the nuts and bolts, how it works. Uh, I think there's a couple of geologists in the room, so you guys might actually have some, some pointed questions on this. Uh, the basic theory is that there's natural background radiation in the soil. There's a certain mixture that varies throughout, throughout the Earth's surface. Um, by using an aircraft-mounted gamma radiation spectrometer, we can measure this radiation signal. Um, and then the real value comes in the fact that water attenuates that radiation signal. So if you know what the concentration of those radioisotopes are uh, over dry bare ground, you go out and you fly it again when there's snow on the ground, that difference tells you exactly how much water there is in the snowpack. It doesn't tell you how deep it is, um, it doesn't really tell you like how warm or anything, but it does tell you exactly how much water there is, which is extremely important to the water forecasters. Uh, software in the aircraft does that comparison and we get the data real time. So we know as we're flying it how much water there is once we complete a flight line. Uh, the single most important point that I'm going to keep coming back to is the values that we generate represent the mean aerial snow water equivalent for a given flight line. So we get, per flight line we get one value. And that's the basis of my project. So this is just a little graphic. Shows how it works. You see the aircraft line. We have to fly at 500 feet. Uh, there's an important signal to noise ratio. If you go any higher than 500 feet, you get a lot more cosmic radiation, background radon, and you reduce that signal that you're getting from the ground. Anything lower than 500 feet, if you've ever flown in a slow fixed wing aircraft, gets pretty dangerous. So 500 feet, I like to call the safety versus signal compromise. Uh, it's also not legal to fly below 500 feet in most parts of the US. Uh, so you can see the, the mixture of the most radioactive elements, the most stable ones, potassium-40, uh, thorium, and uranium. Uh, so this is what it looks like uh, over dry bare ground. They're emitting radiation. We fly again in the winter. Uh, snow, ice, or water reduces that signal, and that difference tells us how much water there is in the snowpack. An important distinction to make is the sensor does not know what state of water it is. So we need to know, going into it, how wet the soil is. It's the top 20 centimeters, so we have to produce a soil moisture estimate or an actual measurement. But then it doesn't know whether it's uh, water in the snow itself or ice on the ground. But at the end of the day, it all melts and goes into the water supply. So the spatial data. So that's really the heart of what my project was. Uh, the lines themselves are designed to allow for continuous data collection for about five minutes. That's about how long it takes and how much ground you need to cover to, 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 to strip out the, the spatial variation in the snowpack itself. So if you think like the movie Fargo, you remember where he's burying the money at that fence post? If you went out and did a core sample there, you might get three centimeters of water. If you went, you know, 100 feet down the road, you might get in a snowdrift, you get 10 centimeters of water. Um, we don't see that variation on the line, but since we're continuously collecting data along the line, at the end we just get an average of the whole line, and then that tells us how much water there is in that particular uh, part of the Earth's surface. Uh, so I think of the spatial data in three different formats. The first is the actual polyline itself. That's what we use for navigation. The pilots uh, originally installed these lines. Uh, some were installed back in the, the early 80s where they didn't have GPS, they didn't have movie maps. They basically had to rely on visual cues. So this line, in particular, North Dakota 413, they're following a railroad track. They start at one road, fly for about five minutes, and end up at the top. That way that line was easily repeatable. So that's the polyline portion of it. And I said the aircraft's at 500 feet above the ground. It actually has a swath of about 1,000 feet. Points out about 45 degrees each side. It's about 1,000 feet wide. So the line itself is 1,000 feet wide by about 10 to 15 miles long. So that represents 
in my in my mind a polygon. So it's actually two and a half square miles that you're measuring the average snow water equivalent. And then the final spatial data point is the actual point itself. Uh, for spatial analysis, we've just historically used the midpoint of the flight line. Like I said, it's measuring an average, and it's a lot easier to do the math. I'm not a math person, so I like having it as simple as possible. It's a lot easier to do the math if we're just using the midpoint and the line. The textual data, um, so this is the background. You can see North Dakota 413. The first three columns represent the actual counts expected if there's 25% soil moisture. So if we go out and fly the line and there is 25% soil moisture, we would expect about 2,453 counts per minute of potassium, 757 counts per minute of thorium, and then about 27,000 total counts. Um, uranium doesn't act uh, uh, consistently enough that we can measure it, so we just measure the whole gamma spectrum and get total counts. So that's the, the, the background nature of the line itself. There's also some other metadata in here, and that's the soil moisture. Remember I said that the sensor doesn't know whether it's water in the snow or in the soil. So we have to tell it what we think the soil moisture is. And there's a couple different ways we do it. Uh, in this particular uh, set of background information, there's two methods there. You see AM and AI. Uh, so the first number is 21%. The second AI right next to it stands for airborne interpolated. Uh, the other one is airborne measured. So this is really the heart of my project. You can see North Dakota 412 was measured at 17.6. North Dakota 414 was measured at 21.5. We did an inverse distance weighted interpolation to come up with that 21% airborne interpolated value for North Dakota 413. So my question was, if we're already doing that for the soil moisture, maybe we can do that for the snow water equivalent and save ourselves some work. And then we also have to provide this to the forecasters so that they know what we used for the uh, initial data. Uh, I talked about spatial variation along the line. Uh, I think that's better illustrated in a mountain line. So this is one of my favorite uh, flight lines we have. This is out in uh, Silverton, Colorado. It starts up in the north at uh, about 11,300 feet. It drops down about 2,000 feet in the course of a few minutes. So it's actually a pretty strong uh, drop. Um, like I said, I have a very rudimentary understanding of physics and meteorology and all that. But I know that elevation, uh, slope, and aspect are going to be huge factors on uh, snow water equivalent. So the value in this line, even though we're not measuring the snow water equivalent at each point along that, we are getting one average value for the entire flight line. And that's still valuable to the forecasters, especially if you live down in Silverton, because you know that's about how much water you can expect when it all melts out. Uh, the flight line output, so what do we actually produce when we go out and fly these lines? Well, it's processed real time in the aircraft. We have uh, really smart folks back at the center, software engineers, that have built a system that collects all that data and applies that background um, file, and it gives us the snow water equivalent as soon as we end the line. Uh, and that's actually where this project started in my head. So I'll take you back to like 2007. It was my second year on the project. Um, Whatever you expect North Dakota to look like in the March, in, in March during when there's a lot of snow on the ground, that's exactly what it looks like. It's just bare white as far as you can see. So imagine you're in my place, you've been flying the survey for two weeks, you feel like you've been on the same line forever. Um, you measure one line and it's 3.5 inches. You go five miles and it's 3.7 inches. So we used to play a game, uh, another pilot and I, especially if he was sitting in the right seat, he'd look out, and then on that third line, he'd, he'd act like he was like deep in thought, like he's like looking out there like, hmm. And he had glasses too, so he'd dramatically take off his glasses, and the line, he'd be like, 3.7. And then it would pop up, 3.7. He's like, well, if we already knew that, we didn't really need to fly the line. So my purpose today is to apply some spatial analysis tools to see if that actually holds up. Um, so the data are sent back to the water center or the Office of Water Prediction up in uh, Chanhassen uh, on a daily basis for quality control. They're then published to the web via the standard hydrometeorological exchange format. Uh, includes all that data from that uh, that line, except for the back. The, the end users don't need to know what our um, potassium counts and all that, but they do need to know what our soil moisture estimates are, so they can apply that to their own estimates. Um, so it tells us the line that was flown, the day it was flown. Um, that percent uh, snow cover, and that's also entered in um, eyeball by the pilots. You can see it's 100%. Uh, and then 
the snow water equivalent, the snow water equivalent normalized for 35% soil moisture, the actual soil moisture that we used in the estimate, uh, the date that was flowed, and then pilot remarks. And you can tell how exciting some of these lines are for pilots. Uh, you see drifting snow, fields doubled, drifting snow, fields doubled. You get a little repetitive. I have quick questions here. Sure. You mentioned uh, the interpolations about using the, the, the some limited data instead of keep collecting more. Well, maybe interpolation can help to avoid some. You use spatial analysis can help to avoid some uh, uh, time cost. Uh, so what kind of interpolations measure or spatial analysis measures did you use before? Did you use grading or? They use inverse distance weighted. Um, we, and you'll still see later, because I actually in this I go IDW versus Kriegen. Okay. Um, neither, like they were kind of neck and neck. Okay. Like some, sometimes Kriegen worked better, sometimes IDW worked better. Okay. Um, none of the other methods work though. Like nearest neighbor and spline, just completely out to lunch for snow water equivalent. Okay. <laughs> uh, so how are the data used? Um, from, from a standpoint of the analysis, back at the water center, um, they create gamma suite images. They take the data, they incorporate them in their national snow analysis, they compare it against ground observations, QPF, any other kind of environmental data they might have out there. And you can see, at, it doesn't really show up too well in this, line, this slide, but here's good old North Dakota 413 with the snow water equivalent measurement, and then they apply that to a, to a grid, and it basically it goes out to the web as a map product that tells you how much snow water equivalent there is in that area. Uh, accuracy, so how good are we at this? Well, uh, according to some actual field studies that they did in the early days of the program, in the area that I'm going to talk about, they were accurate to within about one centimeter of snow water equivalent. So a lot better than you would get from just a couple ground observations. You would need thousands of ground observations along many, many tracks to get this kind of data. So it's accurate and it's efficient, uh, or 5% soil moisture. And that accuracy does vary based on the overall background environment. If you go out somewhere that has very low uh, radiation counts to begin with, it's going to be a lot tougher to measure because you're going to get less signal going through the snow. It's going to vary the, the results a lot more. Um, overall environment, if you go out and fly on a particularly, um, for lack of a better word, radiation-y day, if there's a lot of cosmic radiation in the air or a lot of radon, uh, in the atmosphere, that's going to throw off the data too. But typically we publish about one centimeter of 5% soil moisture. Uh, we can measure up to 39 inches of sweet depending on total amount of background radiation. So for the math folks, what is 39 inches? Anybody? Big metric. Yeah, it's a meter. So um, I've never seen anything close to 39 inches. I think that's published. This is just a theory that I have. It's pet theory. I just think that when they originally designed the software, it, it maxed out basically at 99.99. They used to use DOS to run this stuff, and I think the idea was we can't add another digit. So they just said, yeah, it's 39 inches, and no one really balked at it. So we still say 39 inches. The highest I've ever seen measured was about 30 inches. After that, it just get, you get divided by zero errors, and it just says there's too much snow to really know what's out there. It's still valuable, though, if you know that there's a lot of snow. That, that helps the forecasters. So how do we create these surveys, and how am I going to step into this process to try to make it more efficient? Uh, well, it starts with the river forecast centers. Um, typically, they'll make a request for an airborne survey if they think there's, there's gaps in their data. They'll, they'll send the request to the Office of Water Prediction up in Chanhassen. Sometimes they'll ask for specific flight lines. Sometimes they'll ask for uh, a particular basin or just a general area. Sometimes they're lazy or they're busy and they say, well, just do whatever you did last year or whatever you did last year. So those are actually the easy ones to, to generate, but they're questionable value. Uh, we also have CAN surveys. Uh, for our own purposes, we like to go back and compare historical data. So we've been flying the same set of lines up in Alaska for the last uh, 13 years now. So we've our 14th year collecting those lines in Alaska. So you actually have a very good idea of the snow water equivalent history in Alaska because we fly the same line at the same time of year. So if you were doing, you know, like a climate change analysis or something like that, you could look at that data. So once they have the request from the RFCs, uh, the principal investigator, Kerry Olheiser, up at the uh, Chanhassen office, uses uh, various ARC tools. Uh, she'll compile a list of lines that she wants flown. She'll prioritize against, you know, which aircraft we have available, uh, how many hours they have on it, a couple other factors. 
she'll send that text file to the pilots. And then, because we're NOACOR, we're uniquely trained. Um, you know, we don't just fly the line, we're actually kind of scientists too. So our pilots are trained to use ARC. So they take that text file uh, and they can create these maps that help them fly it. Um, they create state files, uh, they create KMLs that they use actually with moving map software so they can accurately fly the lines. Then it's up to them to go out and actually execute the survey. Uh, they have to think about the limitations on the aircraft. Um, like I said, the weather has to be really good. At 500 feet, you need to be able to see everything. You need to be able to get in and out of your origin airport. Um, you have to be able to see obstructions. And you can only fly under visual flight rules. Uh, we can't fly uh, when the weather is even marginally bad. Uh, maintenance is a big issue. Uh, if you have a survey that has uh, 40 hours worth of work on it, but you only have 20 hours left to the next major inspection on the aircraft, you have to factor that in and maybe prioritize within that survey so we're only going to get half of it done. So part of my project today is maybe investigating how do we figure out what that priority would be. And then ultimately logistics are very important. The uh, sensor itself is uh, very sensitive. It has to be kept in a heated hangar. Uh, has to be taken care of. Pilots kind of have to be taken care of too. They need to stay at nice hotels, nice restaurants. <laughs> they like to have a high quality of life. We like to take care of them. Uh, so our other big limitations, we only have, and I put three sensors, we actually only have two calibrated sensors. So if one of these break, we're down to just one asset. So that's, that's probably the biggest limiting factor. Uh, we only have three calibrated aircraft. Most that we usually are de able to deploy at one time is two. Frequently we're down to one, and coming up in December, actually both aircraft are in major maintenance periods, so we're going to be down to zero aircraft. Um, luckily in December, there's really not too much call for snow survey because the assumption is, well, it's it's just going to keep accumulating. It's not that important to get these surveys done. And they tend to step up in priority in February and March and April when we start really uh, getting our backs up against the wall. And then ultimately, the personnel involved. Uh, that's our other limiting factor. We only have eight qualified mission commanders, plus myself. I actually work full time here, so I'm not available <coughs> too much to go out on the road, but I try to help out as much as I can. Um, but we want to make sure that pilots aren't getting burned out. They can only fly so many hours in a day, so many days in a week, so many weeks in a month. Um, so keeping them fresh, keeping them ready, uh, and trying to get the most value out of each survey is critically important. All right, so how am I going to do that? What are my objectives with this project? Well, using some of the tools that I learned uh, with the master's program at, at Penn State, I want to conduct a rigorous analysis of survey efficiency. I want to investigate whether some lines can be skipped due to high degrees of spatial autocorrelation. Uh, I want to determine whether there were interpolation methods that could yield satisfactorily low sample errors in interpolated values. Uh, I want to reduce the overall survey effort for lots of reasons. Uh, minimize fuel consumption. Uh, safety is, is a huge factor, especially in aviation. Think 500 feet is inherently risky. There's very little time to react if something happens with the plane. Um, you have birds, obstructions, all sorts of bad things can happen out of 500 feet. So if the pilots can spend less time at 500 feet, get up to a safe altitude, and still produce the same quality map products, then that's worth exploring. And ultimately, I want to increase the overall survey value. So if we have a bunch of lines that are tightly clustered and they don't need to be, we can use that same time, that same flight time, to maybe produce a bigger spatial footprint and get more lines out in more remote areas, get better data. Uh, so ultimately, I want to reduce the extraneous effort in areas where it's unnecessary. So now I'm going to talk about what I did and how I did. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the data that were available, uh, how I determined a suitable area for analysis, and then uh, my favorite word, sample optimization. It took uh, Justine and I probably a couple weeks to figure out exactly how to phrase that. Um, data interpolation methods, and whether or not that's, that area could be applied to another survey, and whether any of this actually worked. All right, so anybody can go to the NORIS website. You, look, you click on the Airborne tab, and you go to historical data. You can see everything that I use. It goes back to 1980. Uh, the data are in a couple different formats. Uh, so what I had to do was uh, combine those 36 years of data into one file. Uh, <coughs> The files themselves only contained the line name, the date it was flown, and the snow water equivalent. Now I want a little bit more than that if I was going to do spatial analysis on this, so I had to go find the master flight line shape file, which is also available on the website. Now that master shape file has a ton 
of metadata associated with it. Lots of fields. I think it's up to like 28 different uh, attributes for each flight line. A lot of it's um, uh, you know obsolete. There's there's stuff in there that's no longer needed. There's basin information. There's line length. There's elevation. Some of it's pretty important. What I really wanted was the spatial component to add to the tables that I was using. And those lines actually contained the midpoints in Latin long coordinates. So I pulled the lat longs for each flight line, put it back into my master record list, and merged the two. So now I had a, a common delimited file, an Excel file, that had uh, not only every flight line ever flown, a record of it, I had the lat long for it so I could perform the spatial analysis fairly quickly and easily. So this is what that looks like, that flight line shape file. Uh, you can see our coverage uh, up in Alaska, anywhere in the U.S. that it snows, and we've actually expanded our network to include soil moisture work down in Texas and Oklahoma over the last few years. So now that I have all my records in one spot, how do I figure out which survey I want to look at to do this analysis? Well, if, if I'm looking for oversampling, the first thing I'm going to want to look for is somewhere where they have lots of lines. Uh, that might go without saying, I don't know, but that was the easiest thing to first look at. I wanted to limit the temporal variation, and by that I mean if I flew, or I should say if we flew a survey on Monday and flew 20 lines and then had to take Tuesday and Wednesday as off days because weather was moving in, and then we flew again on Thursday, I don't really want to look at an area because now I've added another source of variation to the data. If, if it snowed or if the snow melted, that's a factor that's not really spatially driven, that would be more temporally driven. So I limited uh, my suitability areas to lines flown in a single day. And that was actually pretty easy to do in Excel. I wanted to limit the geographic extent. So like I said, if I'm flying in a single day, if we were working out of Fargo and in the morning the weather was great out at Minot, we went out and we flew like you know 15 lines out there, we landed, figured out the weather was getting bad there, we went and flew you know, somewhere out in Minnesota. Um, yeah, we might have flown 30 or 40 lines that day, but if they're disjointed, uh, they're not, there's not going to be a spatial component of time together. So I wanted to avoid that. And then, most importantly, I wanted to limit the uh, variability of terrain. Like I said, those lines in Colorado, uh, you can have a line uh, on the east side of a ridge and the line on the west side of a ridge, and they could be the same elevation, they could be only a couple miles apart, but the snow water equivalent difference between the lines could be hugely uh, different. So I wanted to avoid that. So I'm picking somewhere with very low variability of terrain. So it goes back to the upper Midwest, Fargo, North Dakota, you think lots of trains, not a lot of terrain. Okay. Uh, so suitability analysis. Uh, so I said I, sur I grouped the surveys into single days. This kind of shows uh, basically how many lines were collected on the top scoring days. You can see this, uh, there's one called Upper Red where we flew over 80 lines. There's actually two where we flew over 80 lines, one on the Colorado day. Um, so that was just an epic day. So my assumption was if we ever had a day where we oversampled, where we flew too many lines, that was probably going to be it. And that was April 2nd, 2009. And I remember that day because we had both aircraft flying. Um, we were, I think one of us was working out of Minot and one of us was working out of Fargo. And you can see this actually meets all those requirements. The lines are kind of you know, uniformly spread. Uh, there's a couple clustered areas where you might see some spatial autocorrelation. Uh, there's actually some overlap between the two aircraft too. I don't remember exactly why, but 11 of the lines were flown by both aircraft. So I, I basically averaged the values and uh, merged them together. So we actually have 73 unique flight line records for that day. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. So if you did uh, the line twice with two different airplanes, you should get the same answer. It was, like, remember I said it was within one centimeter? Okay. They were, um, I think the furthest they were off was, like, by uh, four-tenths of an inch or something like that. That would give you uncertainty in general, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it would, but if we'd flown all of them together, there would have been that uncertainty throughout the, the whole survey. Okay. So, I, I had to figure out some way to pick which aircraft. I didn't want to just have one aircraft get credit for the line. I wanted to have an idea what the, because that's how it went into the data at the end, was they took an average of it. So I picked my survey area, April, or my survey day, April 2nd, 2009, in the upper Midwest. 
Um, the next thing I'm going to want to do is, is take out some lines and do some analysis on it. <coughs> so this is the optimized sampling and error assessment. So the first thing to do was decrease the sample number using uh, an actual prescribed method, and I came up with this before I did it. Uh, the first one would be random, and that you can think of as kind of like the control group. Uh, the next one was density dependent, and those are more like the, uh, they'd be snow water equivalent independent factors. So this is something that we could do before creating the survey. We could reduce the line, number of lines randomly or reduce them based on the density of the samples themselves. The next two were dependent on the snow water equivalent. So this is, you know, after the fact. Uh, basically, I looked at the snow water equivalent, um, did spatial autocorrelation analysis, and removed the lines that appeared to be the most uh, spatially autocorrelated. Uh, the fourth one was subjective, and that goes back to my original idea for the project. I just basically eyeballed it. I looked at the survey, I said, that line we didn't need to fly, that line we didn't need to fly. That was the one where you know, we, we guessed right when we were in the plane. Uh, I wanted to create different levels of how I did this. So I reduced by 5, 10, and 25%. That way to see if there was any pattern in like exactly how many lines I might be able to remove. Uh, the next step, once I've removed flight lines, would be to create a new interpolated surface off of the remaining sample points. Once I did that, I would then extract the values from the lines that have been removed using the extract from grid tool, uh, and then plot the error. So whatever the difference was between the interpolated snow water equivalent and the actually measured snow water equivalent, that would tell me what my error was for that line. So how'd that look? Um, so this is the random optimization. I just used the random function in Excel. There's probably a million ways you could do this. Um, Basically, I just sorted it by random score to get to 95% of 73. I removed four of the top four scoring lines to get to 90. I think I removed another eight, and then 75, I think, was uh, 13 or 15 lines. So that's what it looked like. Uh, you can see all the different levels of uh, random lines that were removed. Uh, for density dependent, uh, it was a little bit more labor intensive. I used the kernel density tool in ArcMap. Uh, it basically produces a density score. Uh, I think I used 60 mile ring, so it just basically computed how many lines or how many points were within 60 miles of that point and gave you a density score. Uh, the problem with this was it had to be iterative, meaning I had to, I, I'd run it once, pick the top line, then basically have to run it again because I, otherwise I'd end up removing five that were all in one spot. So, um, I have a question here sure. on this, on this slide, of all this part, the sample of my basic masters. I want to ask uh, what is the, the goal for this uh, analysis? Is it uh, for uh, reducing some computing costs when you generate some raster maps, raster imagery of the snow water equivalent value as a map from this limited point? If you reduce some samples, computation may be faster. Or it is it's more like a reflective analysis that gives some guidance in future when you design the survey, you want to avoid some cost. So what is different factors to review some lines in certain scenarios so that based on the correlation still doesn't impact the result accuracy a lot but still being some uh, reasonably good? I'm not sure. And my question is, what is the main goal of this uh, uh, optimization, sample optimization analysis? Is it used to get future survey design or is it used for uh, reducing some computational time when you generate the raster imagery, one to one maps from limited points. So, I, I, yeah, I, I, I think I understand what you're saying, and it's it's kind of two pointed. Like, one part of it is really just, you know, after the fact analysis, it's did we need to fly those lines to produce the same data product? And then the second part of that would be could we avoid flying these lines? in the future and still get acceptable results. So I, I think your question also mentions how are the data used. Yeah, yeah. Um, are they going to be used to generate uh, continuous maps? It Sometimes it is. Uh, that's, that, I guess, is my best answer. It depends on the survey. Sometimes um, this one, I'm guessing April in 2009, they were probably worried about, in fact, I, I think I remember, they were worried about a flood event that was pending. Like, they need to know exactly how much water was out there. Um, so the goal of this would be find out exactly how much water is in all these basins. So this, this survey itself probably wouldn't have been a candidate because, you know, obviously we had two aircraft flying. It was very high importance. If we flew a couple extra lines, it's better than not flying those lines. So 
I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah. Your question. Another corresponding question is: uh, I see here auto switch auto correlation effect at this scale is very really important in deciding uh, whether avoiding a point or have a low sample rate is still have good performance, the accuracy, still have good accuracy. But uh, what the one factor is the distance. The closer distance usually has a higher spatial auto correlation. But what other factors do you think? can influence the scale of spatial auto correlation or the smoothness of the values, like the terrains or the, uh, the land, co land cover types? The, the land cover type is especially important okay. to it, um, especially in North Dakota, because really the, you only have a couple different, you have you know, open fields, you might have a couple wooded areas, and then you might have more. We don't really fly in urban areas, not that you have too many of those in North Dakota anyway. Um, but yeah, there are, so I, I didn't really hit this, but there are, uh, some of the research says there's you know, four different levels of uh, variation, spatial variations, no water equivalent. Um, you've got you know, more like the, like I talked about with the, you know, if you did a core every 100 feet, you'd get huge variation just because of the effects of drift and vegetation. Uh, you know, snow tends to accumulate around trees or pulse total, uh, those effects. Uh, when you get to the watershed level, uh, which these lines are more or less at, you're talking about you know, a 10 to 15 mile track, that water all goes to the same spot. Variation is actually at its lowest because we are getting average values. So the average value in a watershed, you know, five miles away is gonna be pretty close to that one. And then the next level of spatial variation would be the regional, and that's gonna be driven by weather events. Uh, you'll have, you know, you might have one spot that got just a ton of snow and then, you know, 50 miles away, maybe they didn't get any. And that's what we try to capture more often than not. Thank you. Thank you, that's a good question. Um, so like I said, the kernel density tool was a little bit of a pain, but uh, that's how I did it. Uh, the focus method, and this is gonna be the one that was the toughest to explain, it had to follow the same principle as that kernel density. Um, I used the Ancelin uh, cluster analysis tool and heart map. Nice thing about that tool is it produces a local indicator of spatial autocorrelation. Uh, an index that you can actually look at and see how tightly related the software thinks the lines are related to each other, and it also gives a significance value. And the way the map shows it is you can see where the clusters of high values are and where the clusters of low values are, and it actually gives you the outliers too. So one thing I would definitely want to avoid is removing the outliers. Those are the ones that probably either provided the best data or there was something wrong with the line, but I certainly want to get, wouldn't want to get rid of them. I would want to get rid of the lines that all tended to, to band together. Um, like the density optimization process, this had to be iterative, meaning I had to, I had to run it once, remove a line, run it again to remove the next line so I didn't remove, you know, like a whole cluster at once. The subjective method, that was the most fun. That's where I got to go through and, and play second guessing as a pilot and say like, nope, that line is dumb, let's get rid of it. And you can actually see, because you asked about the, um, how I got the, the averages between the two lines, so you can see one it's actually 2.65, so that shows you that it was probably the average between 2.7 and 2.6. Uh, and then, so this is the process. So the optimization interpolation error analysis, step one, is add the data to ArcMap. So this is my whole survey. Next step was to separate the lines that I wanted to remove into a separate shape file. So with the random one, I just picked the lines that I wanted to remove, selected them, export as a separate shape file. I'm embarrassed to admit this next step took me a little bit too long to figure out, but if you just switch the selection and then export it again, then I, now I had two shape files that when you put them together equal the whole survey file and each one uh, can, you can do your own spatial analysis on. So now I have a file of the remaining lines and the file of the lines that I wanted to remove. So the next step was to create an interpolation based on the lines that were remaining. And uh, this is how it looks. You can see that the, uh, the range was from about 1.7 inches to about 5.9 inches. Next step was uh, extract from grid. So the lines that I had been removed, I assigned a value based on the results of the raster. And you can see there that IDW, so this was an inverse distance weighted uh, snow water equivalent measurement. So for the top line there, it picked out four. And then you can see the actual measurement of 3.4 nearby. So I took that table, put it into Excel, uh, calculated the difference between the interpolated and the actually the actual measurement, 
and that gives me my sample error for each line. I then ran the uh, standard deviation tool at the bottom, and that gave me my total sample error for the survey. So before I go into the results, uh, I wanted to have an idea of what acceptable results would be. And after talking to the PI, there's a huge range of that. It depends on what the needs are for that particular survey. So, um, you know, there might be, you know, a survey in, in North Dakota at this time of year, they probably want the, the error to be, you know, less than half a centimeter. Uh, for purposes of this project, I didn't want the error to be any more than the actual instrument error itself. That's what I was going to use as the threshold for whether or not this was successful. So this is the results. Uh, I'll explain the table. So we have the first one is the um, snow water equivalent independent method. So I have the, the random runs and the density dependent runs. Uh, and like I said, I couldn't really pick between IDW and Kriegen. As you can see, the results kind of vary between the two methods. Uh, but the lowest sample error I got was on the 5% random reduction. Uh, and these are in centimeters. So I, I know I started talking about inches, but like I said, I want to go back to centimeters. So I did the math here and converted them all back to centimeters. Uh, so really not very, uh, not very useful. The, uh, the subjective methods, the uh, snow water equivalent dependent methods were even worse, actually. The, uh, the, the spatial autocorrelation index and the uh, Anselm tool yielded uh, errors around, on average, about two and a half centimeters, so not, uh, not very good. Um, a little bit of uh, justification here. The visual method did work, but you can't really know without flying the lines whether it worked. So at least it confirmed my gut instinct that if I hadn't flown that line, would I have still been able to accurately interpret it? interpolated was correct, but like I said, very limited utility in knowing that. Uh, so a little discussion on where those errors came from. If you look at this, this was the uh, density 25% uh, reduction. Um, so you see the, uh, the difference in the snow water equivalent in centimeters between the, the measured value and the interpolated value. There's my old friend, North Dakota 413. That's why I picked on it, because it screwed up my whole uh, my whole analysis with an error of three centimeters. Um, and you can see that those errors uh, basically are just unacceptable. They're outside of that tolerance, and ultimately the method didn't really work. Uh, but because I still had a process, I wanted to test whether or not this would hold true on another survey. I still stuck with the method and applied it to another survey where I had done a lot of samples. Uh, so another one from 1994, show you the results here. Uh, basically, I did a 90% density reduction method. The other ones weren't any better. Uh, I got an error of four centimeters. So the bummer is that it didn't work. We, if we remove a couple lines, there's a couple outliers that basically screw with the data. So the conclusions, what did we learn from this? Um, the random reduction method came closest to the acceptable results. So uh, you know, if, if this were a medical board, I'd say the placebo worked the best. So probably not that useful. Uh, the density-dependent method came close, but even the marginal results that I did get uh, were not duplicated in another sim similar sample survey. Uh, the focus reduction methods were well outside of tolerance for acceptable sample error. Uh, there's probably a hundred different ways I could have done uh, the spatial autocorrelation analysis, and uh, there's probably better <coughs> methods that could have been used, but ultimately that method wouldn't really apply because it was dependent on the snow water equivalent that was measured. So you can't really build a survey based on those results. And then, like I said, the subjective method proved that there were lines flown near each other that did not really need to be flown, but there's no way of knowing what those lines were before the fact. So I said I was going to make some recommendations. So keep on trucking. The folks making the surveys are doing a good job. We're getting all the data that we can get. Uh, continue to create surveys based on the current methodology. I think uh, the PI up there is doing a good job. Uh, but it's not just because you know the, the results were inconclusive. Uh, I'd say that we could still conduct further review of other surveys. Maybe there was something intrinsically wrong with the survey that I picked. Maybe there were like those couple outliers that just skewed the data. Maybe there was a bad line in there. So it's not the end all be all. Uh, maybe there are other surveys out there where certain flight areas are more prone to spatial autocorrelation than has been suggested by this project. Uh, one other idea I had towards the end of this was to look at some of the specific lines. So you saw that table where I showed you know, the scores for each line. Maybe there were a couple lines in there that were really you know, real close in the spatial autocorrelation world. 
maybe I could look at the, his the history of those lines and see if maybe they historically just don't contribute that much to the overall gamma image. Maybe those are the lines that we can get rid of. Um, but that would require uh, another project. So. Thank you. Yeah, I have one, two questions. Sure. One quick question is, uh, those data sets, the sample point, so each line, black line, contains a consecutive point? Or it's just a summarized into one point? It's, it's summarized into one point, so it's a polyline. Um, okay. We don't, the, and it, was, it was originally just a limitation of the software, but it also ties into that spatial variation within the line itself. Okay. If you, we could measure, you know, like every second or every five seconds, there's really no limit, but you would just get crazy numbers. You'd have, you know, because of the variation in background radiation, it would just look like a lot of noise. You'd still want to average it out, and that's what we ultimately do anyway. Um, we have incorporated in the last couple of years because of the new digital processors that we have on the plane. Uh, we've looked at maybe breaking the lines up into mile long or three mile long tracks, uh, especially like that Colorado 144. We have a ton of lines out west where there might be some value in that. And you know, like I said, there's some lines where we max out the system. Well, maybe the lines are just getting maxed out you know, at, at one half of it, but we can still measure the bottom half of the line and still provide good data. Yeah, are these, uh Spatial data sets, open data sets, open to public from the lab sets you, you saw? Yep, no risk, no doubt, guys. Yeah, <laughs> another comment I have is uh, I think the interpolation here is, uh, is, uh, is, is uh, tested. And uh, both Kriging and uh, the reverse uh, distance, reverse distance master, they have assumption that uh, the spatial dependency is only. Uh, Influence is only influenced by distance. Basically, they assume that uh, two locations uh, dependency doesn't uh, relies on directions. Only it depends on the distance level instead of uh, uh, direct. Uh, what is this called? It's called a anisotropy. Yeah. So I, I try. I, I think maybe incorporating the anisotropic assumption looking at some other actual data source, metadata, about the land, like land cover or land terrain, no, is that assuming that it's only depends on distance, may have better interpolations, and it may also influence the comparisons between different uh, sampling optimization methods. I think that's, that's certainly something that could be looked at, in addition to just the you know, if you were looking at, you know, latitude as a factor on snow water for one, I'd probably look at the, um, the meteorological data and see which areas have the most snowfall, uh, you know, look at the radar returns, and, you know, if they're within a certain set for that, they're probably more likely in the end to have the same amount of snow water equivalent, where if uh, a line was outside of a system that moved through, it's likely to be one of the low lines. So that would require a little bit more analysis, but it's certainly something worth looking at. Yeah, I mean, just to follow on that, uh, really, even with a not too sophisticated empirical relationship, uh, even just multi regression or something, you can probably get a better solution with just some basic data sets. That, because Kriging is is kind of, yeah, it's a tricky, tricky little thing you know, when you have such large areas. And, because they don't, cre they don't interpolate between those <laughs> survey points uh, for their forecasting, right? They just I don't know what they do now. I know what they did, you know, 10 years ago when I was up at that office. Um, and it was a lot of pre-gain and... Oh, really? so they do um, but all I can really speak to is how we did those soil, the fall soil moisture, because the pilots actually did that. That was one of my roles when I was up there. Um, I didn't come up with the method, but they said, like, here's how we generate those soil moisture estimates. And the idea behind the soil moisture estimate was at least it's something. So I, I think they're better at it now. They probably have a lot more data sets that they look at. But um, as far as what methods they're using right now, I'm not sure. And why, I, I'm not sure I understand why the ones, I, I, I know you said that the, the, the one centimeter is the, the, the instrument error and it's unacceptable to go be, be up above that. That seems a bit harsh though because yeah, I mean, you, you you would expect a reduction in accuracy. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, my intuition would be, 
uh, how much, what's, what error is, is reasonable for the application that we're looking for? And I don't know if one or two centimeters is way too much than what they can tolerate. Or it would have been really tough for me to justify using this if my error was more than a centimeter. Like if I had gone back to the PI and said, hey, this method works, but you're going to have an added sample error of one and a half centimeters, then she probably would have just said, well, then you need to go fly that line. Um, so I said, I, yeah, I was kind of hard on myself for that one centimeter, but the idea was we need, I needed to have some sort of rule and the instrument error seemed like a good place to start. So following on this, what is the instrument error? I'm actually a radio chemist and I use balance spectrometry all the time. Awesome. So it's like the, even in lab conditions, you can get an uncertainty as low as 10%. Like, I, this was airborne gamma spectrometry, the error of measurement is really high. And I don't expect, like, I think you're really pushing the envelope with the one centimeter. I think you're really, I'm just thinking the same way as Sagi, that the one centimeter is actually beyond the, the uncertainty of the, method, the measurements. Like, gamma spec is known to be very large, with a very large uncertainty. I mean, and it's airborne, even in the lab, it's... The, uh, I mean, I, I've, I read the paper by Dr. Carroll that he wrote when he originally started this, uh -huh. and there is a little bit of dark magic involved in coming up with I, some of those yeah, background counts. The other question I would have asked, but I'm not sure how much you know about it, is the calibration. That's why I asked, like, like, if it <laughs> yeah, and, like you, you should come to the, the water center and see our lab. We actually have the sensor there. You we have, have the we sensor? Have, we have what dope. kind of sensor is it? Oh, don't look at me. Uh, he knows it's about a that. Simulation, a sodium iodide simulation crystals. It's a sodium iodide. Yeah. We have the manual detector in our lab, so we can do some cross calibration for eventually. But uh, in general, this metal is like with large and sort of empty. Is that something fed back from the users? Like the RFCs say, once, I mean, it just seems really small for the, the error. Yeah. And that's that's what I thought too, but that's you know, the data that they collected I when mean, they did the field tracks. I mean, you have to look at the calibration before you determine your one centimeter threshold. Like, calibration would give you, like, reasonable uncertainty for the measurement itself with analytical error. And then you add to this, like, heterogeneity of, like, the landscape and all that, and it's just like, I don't know why you put one centimeter. <laughs> it, it, it seems to me to, too, too low, like, I don't know, based on what I know about uncertainty of the metal. I also think that the, perhaps because of that, one of the most revealing thing about the whole printing of the whole interpolation is the differences between the 95, what was it, 90, 85 and 75 or something? It was 95, 90, and 75. Yeah, so these differences basically are reduction in uh, prediction accuracy, uh, I think is in, in many cases more revealing because you have uncertain, you have errors that are not because of, it's just because of the interpolation is, is never going to be perfect, right? And you expect a reduction in, in performance due to lower number of points. But if that reduction is not that high, then you're probably on the right track, I would say. And I, I thought that there's something to that in the spread. Um, I, I meant to, to actually graph these, but uh, you can see it. It doesn't really follow by what method was used or by the number of lines reduced, especially in the density dependent. Like there's a, you know, the 90, the 95 percent threshold got it down to 1.0 centimeters or 1.08 centimeters, and then uh, the density down to 75 percent got it down to 1.24. So. I, I think there is a lot of noise in in that, but the fact that they were all within a pretty narrow range tells me that there was something just intrinsically wrong with the reduction method. Uh, I didn't see any skewing of the data. Um, I, I could produce that too and see if it was you know uh, skewing it low or skewing it high. I just produced the, the average error, uh, but that would be one other thing to look at. What if you almost do the opposite? Is 
to say, okay, I have all these flights, right, the, the, all this data. Let's say I ask you to fly, you know, certain, let's say North, North Dakota, and I tell you you can only fly, I don't remember how many you have, but let's say 20 flights, and you choose where to, to kind of fly them. Um, and I don't know, I'm kind of thinking out loud kind of thing, but then would it be acceptable or do you just need more? Well, I mean, the, the pilots themselves are responsible for flying the lines, and like you see here, I'm not exact. You know, they're not exactly you know river forecasters. They they do follow the like the, the mission instructions, and they need those mission instructions. Um, I've pushed uh, as of late to give them a little bit more autonomy and let them decide. Uh, a lot of times, we will give them surveys that we know are not going to be completed, and we basically just say, hey, whatever lines work best with the weather. I saw that map I showed, there were three different priorities. We'll say sometimes the pilot's like, make sure you get those red lines. Those are the top priority, we really need those. Uh, if you can get the blues and you can get the greens, go ahead, but make sure if you get that good weather day to hit those reds first. Uh, so we do kind of provide a little bit of decision support for the pilots executing the lines. But ultimately, like I said, it's, it's guided by weather. Uh, if they can't fly lines in a certain area, they're gonna go out and fly those low priority lines. No, what I'm, what I'm sort of saying, this kind of approach maybe can use to develop more informed strategies of selecting where to fly, kind of thing. That's what I'm kind of thinking. Do I that's, that, that's ultimately what I was getting at, was yeah. are there areas, and you can see in the map, that, that has been their approach um, historically. They, they focus on those lines that they really care about, for especially the Red River. I can see down between Fargo and Grand Forks, we just fly a ton of lines. <coughs> down there. Uh, we could fly more lines out to the west or out to the east of there, but they're not as prone to flooding, so they don't really care as much. One more yes, question about Alaska data that you mentioned that you had about 13, 40 years of data. Yeah, Is I think, publicly I think, available? Yeah, absolutely. That would be super interesting to look at. You said you started to do more soil moisture. Is that do you, do you feel that our, that that instrument is robust for, for that kind of measurement? That's kind of the million dollar question right now. We have we have funding and allocated resources to fly um, during the times of year during the summer um, when that would when that data would be collected, and we have done a lot of work out in Texas and Arkansas. You saw all the new lines down in the areas that are that are getting those floods or getting droughts. Uh, we haven't quite yet opened up in the southeast. Uh, there's a lot of people who are questioning how valuable this data is, and I have not yet heard the feedback from the southeast river forecasters or the folks in Texas about the lines. We've only flown the lines, I think, two years. So the first year was kind of like, a, hey, we can fly these lines. You know, what do you think? And I don't think we have the results yet from the second year as to like how much they helped the um, the decision makers for those areas. But it's something like if it if it does prove valuable, we probably will expand that flightway network uh, throughout the southeast. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much. You so thank much. You. Uh, I just want to quickly acknowledge uh, Dr. Blanford for coming down. Um, my first advisor was uh, Dr. Thorsten Wagner when I started. I don't know if you ever worked with him. I think he. <laughs> That was like six years ago, but he got me started on a lot of this stuff. Um, Carrie Eliza, the PI, and the uh, members of the NWC and Office of Water Prediction staff that helped me out with this. And most importantly, my family who supported me through all this. So thank you.